Let's have a look at seven advantages of curved swords. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator Troy. Now what we're going to look at in this video are seven clear advantages of curved blades on swords. Now that's not to say, of course, that straight swords, straight blades, don't have some of their own advantages which curved swords don't have. But specifically for this video, I've identified what I consider to be seven clear advantages for curved blades on swords. It's very clear if we look throughout history that the question of a straight blade versus a curved blade has been one which many cultures in many periods have tried to address and there's never been a final solution on which is better because they're better for different things of course. But the fact is we have to accept that we find straight and curved blades in uh, parts of Asia like Japan and China um, and in India as well of course and we find straight and curved blades in Europe also. They have different strengths and weaknesses. So what are what I consider to be the seven strong advantages of a curved blade? Well before I break those down I first of all want to have a word about our sponsors who are Ray Shadow Legends. Raid is the hugely popular turn-based fantasy combat game. It's absolutely free to play, it's free to advance and get better in, and you can download it onto your PC or your mobile phone right now. Now speaking about curved swords, there's a number of my champions have got curved swords, let's have a quick look at them. There's my shaman, and you can see there that she's got a couple of sort of uh, sabers or falchions, pretty cool looking thing. Here's one called the Sand Lash Survivor. And she's got a massive great two-handed um, saber, I would say it's something like a Miao Dao, like a Chinese sword. And here's another one called the Avenger, and she's got some really awesome uh, kind of, they're a bit like Katana or maybe Da, um, pretty sweet swords anyway, and uh, I love her outfit. Not all of the champions have curved swords, but a lot of them have really, really nice armour. Since I started playing, there have been a huge number of updates in the game. So what's new in Rogue? Well, you don't have to take my word for it, you can check other people's reactions in the App Store, Reddit and elsewhere. They recently made their biggest ever update, the Doom Tower. It's a giant tower with 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms and 12 seriously badass bosses to take on. And I've been having a blast on it so far, and you don't have to take my word for it. Check out the comments on Reddit, the app stores, YouTube videos and so on. Pretty much everyone's loving it. And that's not all, with a bunch of new champions coming soon, a load of awesome events coming up through February, along with some special Valentine's Day events, there's never been a better time to dive in and get started. So go to the description under this video, click on the special links there and if you're a new player you'll get 50,000 silver, 50 gems, one energy refill, one clan boss key and five mystery shards plus one day XP booster and one free champion, the Executioner. All this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox. These rewards are only for new players and only for the next 30 days. You can find me in game under the name Captain Context of course and if you're quick enough you can join my clan. So as simple as that, it's free to download, free to play, go and have a great time and I'll see you there. So thanks very much for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the topic of this video which are my seven defined advantages of a curved blade on a sword. First up, I want you to consider the issue of edge alignment. Now clearly, when we're cutting with any sword, edge alignment is super, super important. If we're using a uh, straight blade, if we just grab this uh, big long sword here, for example, then if your edge alignment is, um, at, you know, is leading with the edge and is correct, then that's great. Um, however, one thing we have to notice is that when you have a curved blade, you have an asymmetry to the sword, okay? Regardless of the hilt type, but just the blade alone, being curved gives you an asymmetry, which means that you can actually feel the edge alignment a little bit better in the hand. This becomes even more distinct with particularly curved blades. It's actually quite difficult to swing a very curved blade like um, this Killich um, bladed sword here, or indeed uh, one of the more curved sabers. And yes, indeed, with even with um, relatively modestly curved blades like Japanese swords, be they a, uh, tachi or katana or whatever, wakizashi, you do feel the curvedness, you do feel the asymmetry in your hand and this aids edge alignment. One of the issues with um, straighter blades, if I grab in fact a smaller, slightly more manageable for the room size, um, uh, bastard sword here, Indeed, um, if you've got two hands or one hand on the weapon, um, there are some clues to edge alignment, particularly if you've got a cross guard, for example, anything which is an extension out from the central axis, the rotational axis of the um, sword itself or weapon, 
but the straight blade doesn't really give you any assistance because it's completely symmetrical. So, my first major and probably one of the most important advantages in my mind to a curved blade is that much like an axe or anything else which has a projection in one particular direction, it aids in edge alignment. Now another major advantage that I consider to a curved blade is in follow through. What do I mean by that? Well quite simply, when you strike a target, and here is a Burmese Dar 19th century, um, when you strike a target there is a moment at which you impact with the target and you start to cut into it but also through it. Now, um, one of the advantages of a cut over a thrust is a thrust enters the target and stays there until you physically extract the blade. And that blade does need to be extracted, unlike with a blunt sword, be it a kendo shinai or a fencing foil or whatever, that just um, stops on the target and doesn't enter the target. With a sharp blade, it does enter the target and needs to be pulled out again before you can either attack again or indeed defend yourself with that weapon. And that's quite important with defense, and I've talked about that in previous videos. But if you're gonna attack again or defend again, there is a degree of follow through with a cut that you naturally get. So when the blade enters and passes through the target, it frees itself naturally with the very action of cutting. And the more effective the cut is, of course, the quicker it frees itself. If it goes straight through the target, then it will be free again to either cut again or defend or whatever you need to do with it. So a curved blade actually assists in that by its curved nature. It's more likely to, unless it completely bisects the target and then it doesn't really make any difference whether it's curved or straight, a curved blade, because of its curved nature, draws through the target more conveniently than the straight blade. And one of the reasons for this is that the curved blade slants away from the target as it passes through it. This is assuming it's a backwards curve rather than the forwards curve. I'll deal with forwards curves perhaps in a future video. A straight blade has a lot of hacking potential and straight, you know, will cut with a lot of force and will uh, pass directly through targets. If you completely bisect a tatami mat with a straight or a curved blade, there's no real difference. But as it's passing through the target, the curved blade will um, potentially draw through and free itself more easily, more quickly, um, and is more likely to come out. If you think about it in these terms, I'll just grab this very curved, Killich bladed um, Prang Nabu um, again. This is very curved here. If it enters the target um, at this point, at the center of percussion, once it enters the target, the rest of the blade is sort of aligned with the motion of the cut. Um, and so it will naturally free itself a bit like pulling a thrust out of a uh, target. Okay, whereas a straight blade would be sticking off in here and would still be trying to fight its way through that target, through the whatever that target's made of, meat or, or tatami mat or anything else. So while that straight blade would still be trying to pass through the material, the curved blade is kind of in and out um, in a more natural line, essentially because the curve follows the arc of the cut uh, more closely. So the next advantage that I would give to curved blades is accessing them, drawing them from the scabbard. Now this is very important of course because swords are in most cultures and most periods and most situations a backup weapon, a sidearm, something you wear at your side like a knife or a pistol. And very often in self-defense or uh, even combat situations on the battlefield when you come to access that weapon, you need to get it quickly, okay? You need to be able to get it out quickly and deploy it quickly, but it's not necessarily in your hand pointed at the enemy at the moment that you need it there in your hand. So you need to get it out of the scabbard. And, you know, there have been whole uh, martial arts or aspects of martial arts which have been focused on this in Japanese martial arts, EI or Iaido. And in fact, we find these sword drawing techniques as well in European treatises. We find it in Fiori de Liberi, Filippo Vardi, a bunch of other um, treatises also. Um, so getting the sword out quickly is super important. And it can be done with any type of sword. And of course, you can train it. The more you train it, the better you'll get at it, like everything else. Now, with a straight sword like this uh, Chinese Jian, um, we, there are numerous ways that we can uh, access the sword and get it out quickly. Generally speaking, that's one of the reasons sword, swords in most cultures tend to be worn quite low down, hung quite low, because that gives you more space to draw the sword out. And indeed, a fairly long blade like this, it's about 37 inches, I think, uh, can straight blade can be drawn out quickly. But you have to remember that most movements of the body 
are rotational. And being rotational, they are arcs and not straight lines. Now we can force the body to move in straight lines, and of course there are some things which the body naturally does in straight lines. But in terms of drawing a sword, in order to draw the sword out when it's a straight blade, we need to move the sword artificially in a straight line in order to um, access the weapon. Inevitably, with a curved blade, um, it is, um, can be a little bit more convenient to get the sword out more quickly and access it when the motion is in a curved line. And indeed, certainly if you were going to cut at the end of that, cuts being Whilst they can be delivered straight with a push or a draw cut, they, um, and obviously a thrust is a straight line, most cuts have a rotational element to them. And if there is already a curved line to the drawing, that naturally links into a curved line with the cut. And this is what the Eido is uh, largely based on. But the fact is that um, a curved blade naturally will come out of its scabbard more easily. And what's interesting is um, very curved blades, I'll go back again to this Prang Naber, but I could be using the 1796 type um, sabre blades behind me here. They come out very, very naturally out of their scabbards in, in a curved line, which leaves you in a position to either cut from there or indeed to cut directly from the scabbard. Um, and of course you could thrust from there as well. But the fact is that they come out of the scabbard in a curved line because they've got a curved blade. And this can be conducive with certain movements which we often find ourselves wanting to do in either a self-defense or a battlefield um, skirmish melee situation. So the next advantage that I consider, actually this is, to me, it's an important one. I think it's um, uh, very important. We need to do more uh, testing to demonstrate this um, with actual sort of scientific data. But I think that it's uh, fairly sound and that I don't think many people would um, argue with this, but we'll see. And you're always welcome, of course, to comment underneath uh, my videos and we can have some dialogue about this. But to my uh, way of thinking and my experimentation, the things that I've found through uh, years of sword use, a curved blade focuses the energy into a smaller, smaller area of the blade. Now, why you might say, why is this a good thing? Well, quite simply because you're concentrating the energy that you put into the weapon, so um, mass and velocity, you're putting that into the weapon, you're striking the target, and it's, when it's impacting the target, there is a transference of energy. And the smaller area of blade that that energy transfers into, the a greater penetration you'll get, basically, on the target. And we love deep penetration when it comes to uh, blades. Now, the perfect uh, kind of example of this is the use of the point, of course. And we all know that points will get deeper penetration than cuts into a, a large gelatinous mass. Um, and when we're talking about the, like penetrating armor, for example, you basically, most types of effective armor, you can't penetrate with cuts, um, but you can penetrate them uh, sometimes with thrusts, okay? So when you concentrate energy into a smaller surface area, like a point, uh, then it becomes more penetrative. Now, this is also true of edges. If we focus the uh, moment of impact into the smallest area of blade possible, you're more likely to pass through more of whatever material you're striking. Okay. Now, a curved blade, how does that do that? Well, I've got a magazine here to demonstrate this. So, uh, if we roll up this uh, magazine um, like that, then you will notice so this could be anything, could be a tatami mat, could be an arm, could be whatever. Hold on, let's get this magazine rolled up properly. Then um, when the edge impacts it, it impacts it only with a tiny little bit of surface there. And as that thing compresses, it's still a relatively small part of the blade because the blade is curving away from it on both sides of the point of impact. Now, if I grab a straight blade over here, it's not a huge difference, but it's a small difference. And when you're talking about millimeters over that short surface area, that can mean quite a lot. With a straight blade, when it impacts it and we squish down, you'll notice it makes contact with a far greater portion of the blade. So quite simply, if you're striking onto a target, um, you know, be it an arm, a shoulder, a head, or a tatami mat, or a water bottle, or whatever, the straight blade will make contact with a longer surface area of edge, and that means that the energy will be spread over a broader surface. So my belief is that a curved blade helps focus the energy into a smaller area and increase penetration, which is always good.
Now, most cultures have versions of specialised thrusting swords. Um, in Europe, we famously got the um, rapier, um, we've got the small sword, various small forms of small sword, the spadroon, which is sort of compromised design. And indeed, um, even if we go into um, famous cutting swords like the um, basket hilted back sword, they, they can still thrust. And certainly, if we look at the manuals and treatises for the use of these uh, from the 17th, 18th centuries, then they are used for thrusting equally with cutting. So, straight blades clearly are well adap adapted to thrusting and all over the world in all different cultures they have developed types of straight bladed swords that are very effective thrusters while still being able to cut well. So people often write off a curved blade as something which is yeah that's great for cutting but not good for thrusting and whilst it's generally true that straight blades offer more advantages in the thrusting game an advantage of a curved blade is it can do curved thrusts and that's something a straight blade can't really do it kind of can do so with the straight blade indeed we often find uh, movements um, in swordsmanship where indeed you increase the angle of the, the hand is coming in at so that you can thrust around or bind into a, an opponent's sword okay just to explain a little bit what I mean there if an opponent's sword is this side here and I'm pushing into their blade with the back end of my blade I can still have my point online and deliver a thrust okay and obviously that's true on both sides it can be true low or high equally I can have an absence of bind so I can come around a person's sword and thrust here to come around their guard or parry or whatever um, or just simply to make it more difficult for them to guard or parry um, so I can change the angles at the points coming in at but that's also true of a curved blade and one of the interesting things about a curved blade is that you can achieve angles of thrust that don't happen with a straight line because this is a curved line and indeed if you're coming around someone's weapon um, so for example if I cut from uh, my right hand side and they guard okay so they guard against that cut I can now flip the sword and thrust around their guard so there are angles that you can achieve with the uh, thrust with the curved blade that you simply can't achieve with a straight blade. Not saying that that means that this is advantageous universally in thrusting systems. Generally, straight blades are overall better um, as thrusting swords, particularly because the uh, energy that you're putting into the sword is in a direct line uh, up the blade. With this, with a curved blade, the energy gets diverted because the point is in, not in line with the rest of the blade. So generally speaking, straight blades are better at thrusting, but it is nevertheless worth mentioning that an advantage of curved blades is that they can do certain types of thrust slightly more effectively, perhaps, uh, certainly in terms of coming around an opponent's blade or hitting at angles that are somewhat uh, difficult to predict and defend against compared to a straight blade. So there we go, another advantage of curved blades, they can do some quite funky and interesting types of thrusts. And also just lastly to uh, join to that point is the fact that these interesting angled thrusts can be particularly useful on horseback. Now imagine, we, we normally think of, I am a, I'm a human sized um, a person fighting a human sized opponent, and so we're thinking about two people at the same height. But if one person's on horseback and the other person isn't, then that completely changes because one person is now significantly higher than the other. And if you're on horseback thrusting at people on foot, then indeed having my hand at this height but my point at this height and delivering thrusts to uh, people on foot, infantry, while I'm on horseback, it's cavalry, um, that can be advantageous. So um, indeed, as well as coming in at some quite funky angles, that funky angle can be used particularly when you're on horseback. So what I have here are two blades. Um, one is actually British um, and the other one is um, from Southeast Asia. But the fact is they're both inspired by Turkish kilic or pala blades. Um, and these have a particular feature to these blades that give us another advantage for curved blades. And that is this rather expressive and large and noticeable false edge. Okay, now I should mention this is only an advantage to curved swords that have a false edge. Indeed, not all curved swords do. Um, an obvious example is the Japanese sword, unless it's a, there are a few um, uh, Naginata type um, blades which do in fact have a false edge on them, but generally speaking, Japanese swords are completely single edged, they have no false edge. So this advantage doesn't apply to those, it doesn't apply to the uh, Burmese Da, it doesn't apply to most 
Indian talwa, um, although it does apply to uh, some. In fact, I've got one here. Um, so here's an Indian talwa, which does in fact have a large yelman, as it's called, or full sedge on the back. Now, what's interesting is that when you have the large full sedge or yelman, Having such a curved blade enables you to come in with cuts, with full sedge cuts, particularly at a person's sword hand and wrist. Now these were called in British and French circles as the manchette, and manchette just means sleeve in fact, but Sir Richard Francis Burton, for example, um, actually has a section in his fencing treaties using the sabre, the military sabre, um, rather than the modern Olympic sabre, um, and he specifically describes how to use the full sedge for cuts against the opponent's um, hand and arm. But additionally, if we look at um, Alfred Hutton's The Swordsman from 1897, when he's talking about uh, the British officer fighting against uh, an Afridi um, swordsman using a tulwa or pulwa with a shield, um, and he uses the full sedge as well, and that's with the British officer's sabre, which doesn't, it does have a full sedge, but it's not a particularly big or, or expressive one like the Turkish um, kilic. And he uses the full sedge for the coup de Janak, for example, which is cutting the back of the opponent's hamstrings with the full sedge. He does it across the back of the neck and this kind of stuff. So you can use it in a situation where maybe ideally you would have given a thrust, but you come in to grapple, you're too close, you're in a clinch, and in a clinch you can use the full sedge behind the person's body. So you come so close that you're a wrestling and punching distance, and you can apply the full sedge in that distance behind the person. Now this has other uses. You can use it against a person with a shield. So say, for example, you cut in at someone and they've blocked, they've blocked with a shield. You put the shield in here, you can now wrap your sword around over the top of the shield and cut with the full sedge. Uh, you can apply it to the opponent's legs to come around the back of their hamstrings. So there are biological advantages. Sometimes the, the tender uh, and important bits of a person's body, their arteries, their tendons, things like this, can be difficult to get to with a direct attack, but you can get to them with this almost hooked, scything attack. Um, and the other thing we have to note as well is that sometimes you can get in with the full sedge cuts from angles that you wouldn't be able to get in with a direct cut, either with a curved um, blade concave, um, sorry, convex edge or a straight edge, that you can get in with a concave or hooked edge. So there are some advantages to these sickle or scythe-like cuts, which of course you get with a curved blade if that edge is sharpened. So there's another advantage of curved blades. So the final advantage for curved blades, and I was in two minds about whether to include this because I think uh, that we need some uh, physics or mechanical engineering or engineering people to uh, weigh in on this, but I believe that a curved blade has increased structural integrity compared to a straight blade, which potentially makes it stronger. Okay, so if we just pick up a completely different blade for a second, that being um, the rapier. Now everybody knows that a rapier can flex in this plane. Okay, uh, and that's a good thing because it means it absorbs shock. It means that if it comes up against a target it can't penetrate with the point, uh, then it will bend instead of break uh, or bend uh, or stay bent. Um, so being flexible is an advantage uh, some of the time. But something that a lot of people don't realize is that while blades in the plane of the flat can flex, they also flex, not necessarily visibly, although if you take high speed photography or video you will notice this if you slow it down, when you're cutting things, um, they will also flex in the plane of the edges as well. Okay, so if you hit a target, and remember of course this happened in war where you, the edge might not pass through something, something hard like a helmet, even sometimes a person's head, there are records of blades bending and breaking on people's heads, skulls, evolution have given us a good bony knob, um, and so that's there to protect your brain. And um, the fact is that these will encounter hard objects, other weapons like spears and um, muskets and other swords, shields, helmets, all this kind of stuff. And they will um, give, they will uh, absorb some of that energy in flexing in every plane of the blade. Now the fact is that a straight sword, if you imagine building a straight, uh, a bridge, which is just a straight plank, versus having a one that is a, uh, has got a curve to it, we all know that arches, um, can sustain a lot more weight than just a flat beam. Okay, now of course a flat beam can also be very really strong and you can make it strong with its cross section like an H beam or I girder, whatever you want to call it. So with its cross section you can make a straight length much stronger. But the fact is that when you make something curved, if the energy, if the sort of 
damaging energy, if the potentially harmful energy is happening here, this is an arch and I believe is better at sustaining whether it's guarding against blows or whether it's hitting something that's very resistive like someone wearing armor or a shield or just passing through a thick target. Um, indeed, I believe that this is less prone to um, harmful damage to the material of the blade. And remember, historically, all these blades weren't made of the best steel that we have now and they weren't made of, uh, they didn't necessarily have the best heat treatment uh, that we can ensure with all of our modern technology. So. Um, the material was sometimes prone to failure and swords did break throughout history in every culture. Um, so if you can make the shape of the blade stronger and less likely to break, then I think that's a good thing. And I would add to that as well that if we go back to the first point I made about advantages of curved blades, about edge alignment, uh, one of the things that um, sometimes happens with these um, straight blades is if they don't pass through the target, then they wrap around it. And if you watch shows like Forged in Fire, you'll see when people have made particularly flexible straight blades, if the edge has not penetrated the target, the thing that pretty much always happens is the blade turns to its flat and then the whole flat wraps around the target. So quite simply, I think that having a curved blade which is less likely to, um, uh, to do this and is, has got more structural integrity like an arch carrying a load on the top I think that's an advantage to curved blades. Now, one final caveat I want to add to the whole curved blade uh, debate or question or point is also about tang or, or grip, hilt, angle, okay? Now, this changes a lot of things and it changes how the curved blade behaves. So a lot of people are familiar with Japanese swords, but one particular and quite unusual uh, or rather characteristic feature of Japanese swords is that their curve follows through the blade and the tang. Now this is particularly expressed in earlier Japanese swords if we go back to the um, sort of 10th to 14th century, then the tachi tends to have a, a, a continual curve and in fact most of the sori or curve as it's called is actually in the base of the blade and into the tang. Uh, if we go into later the uchigadana and the katana um, then you're more familiar with a straight line from the grip to the be beginning of the blade and then a gentle curve. But nevertheless what's interesting is that they curve the grip or the, the hilt he, uh, curves away from the cutting angle. Now we do find this in some other swords. It's not just particular to Japanese swords. For example, we find it in the Da, in the Burmese Da. But contrary to that, if we look at um, other types of saber from the world, if we go to not that far away in world terms, the Indian Talwar, the Indian Talwar tends to have a hilt which is in the direction of the cutting edge. Okay, so this hilt curves forward. The Japanese and the, um, uh, the in that case, Burmese hilt curve away from the cutting edge. So what does this mean? Well, they're both curved blades, and I believe that the seven advantages that I've spoken about still apply to all of these curved blades. It doesn't change that. But I do think it's worth mentioning because the effect of the cutting is slightly different for each of these. Where the hilt curves um, away or with the curve of the blade, this naturally is going to have a more slicing effect. It does also change other things to do with how you draw the weapon and all sorts of other things as well. But primarily, if we're just talking about the, the basic, the most obvious thing, it means that you naturally get a more slicing effect to the curve because the curve is coming away the whole time from the thing that you are cutting at. Um, when we have a, um, a blade that has a hilt which actually curves in the direction of the edge, it has more of a cleaving or chopping effect. If you imagine an axe, with an axe you have a shaft and then you have the blade sticking out to the side and the blade is in front of the um, axis of uh, rotational motion, the stick you're swinging basically. So the stick you're swinging, the blade or the edge, the moment of the, the point of impact is in front of that. And that actually happens with these curved blades because if you look at the line of the hilt, the line of the hilt leads to a line actually behind here and the cutting edge is out here. So they're similar to an ax. They actually strike in front of the hand and then they slope away. And it's the same here with the um, Parang Nabur where the um, angle of the grip you see there goes out to here behind the cutting blade so the cutting blade is in front like an axe 
and then it slopes away. Again, if we go to the European sword, it's a little bit less expressed with this one, but you can see that we've got a general tendency. This one down here is particularly uh, quite uh, sloped forward. With this um, sloped forward grip, again, it means that the line of um, motion is behind the point of impact, so it's a bit axe-like. So we've got a very powerful chop and then a slope away. So not all curved swords uh, perform in exactly the same way. There are some differences, but all of these seven advantages that I've talked about for curved blades in this video do apply to both of those types of curved sword. So to sum up, uh, just to reiterate that this video is not to say curved swords are the bestest swords ever. Okay, they're not magical. They're not, um, they're not, they don't supersede straight swords. Straight swords have their own advantages. Okay, and there are lots of advantages to straight swords. Obviously, uh, particularly in thrusting and um, penetrative power in thrusting, but there are some advantages to straight swords both in um, parrying and defending yourself, but also to some degree in cutting as well. And it should be said that some of the advantages of a curved sword can be simulated through your system of swordsmanship with a straight sword, okay? And that gets into the issue of wrist angle and how we apply the cut. But that is a massive topic for another video. I've touched on it in previous videos. So have a look at some of my past videos um, if you're not familiar with them all because this is a topic that I've gone into across a lot of different videos broken down in little bits. So straight swords and curved swords certainly both have their place in the world and both have different advantages and disadvantages um, and relatively you know, different merits essentially, different strengths. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting and thought provoking. As always, I'm always interested to read your thoughts and feedback below. And um, hopefully I'll see you again on the channel for another video, either talking about curved swords or straight swords or something that's not even about swords. So see you soon folks and cheers for watching. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.